Hi, it's Bill the Sky Guy, and welcome to video number four in the saga of building my personal remote observatory. In video three, quite exciting if I do say so myself, we got the pad poured. That was back in May. It's now October, and the delivery of the actual next dome itself is now imminent. So my testing of the electronics components, video two of this series, should be completed, and larger scale tests of the complete systems working together will need to be done before deploying everything on site. Now that the pad has had a full month to fully cure, it was time to seal it. Unfortunately, it was so wet here, raining nearly every day for a couple of months, I wasn't able to get to that for three months after the initial pour. So I had to choose the sealant product and get the rollers, paint, pan, and et cetera together. My friend Billy at Day Gig Painting was very good with that. Do some weeding around the edges so I could get to the sides of the pad to seal them. Do two coats of sealant and try and keep the bugs off of it while I was drying it between coats. Lots of stuff. There were a couple of good online videos about Next Dome that I ran across and made notes of some things to do that are helpful. Um, first of all, I put some pavers from the pad to the road because you kind of have to go through some mud. Uh, it was advised to mark the center of the pad, so I did that. I used a four-foot string with a marker at the edge of it to draw out an eight-foot circle that would identify the wall boundaries. Apparently, it's very beneficial for dome rotation to make sure that the walls are as perfect a circle as possible, and having a circle on the ground helps that when you put it together. I marked the exact cardinal directions for north, south, east, and west on the pad itself for alignment of the pier. I used my pointing laser on a mic stand to shine it through the center of the point on the pad and hit the north star, and that allowed me to get north and south. For east and west, I just used a right angle tool at the center point. Now, you remember in previous video when I was talking about sinking those J-bolts into the wet concrete on the concrete pour video, but I couldn't because of the rush and to get it done so fast? Well, I'm so glad I didn't because I found out later that the pier doesn't actually go in the center of the dome. It's the intersection of the mounts RA and deck axis that goes at the physical center of the dome, not the physical center of your mount. Unless, of course, it's specifically designed that way, and a few are. In my case, it was five inches offset to the north, so that means that the pier is going to be mounted five inches south of center, which puts the scope's rotational center at the center of the dome, not the physical center of the mount. As a check, you can drop a weighted string from the apex of the dome, and it should hit that spot on your mount. There was lots to do in this regard. First, I wanted to make sure I really understood how all of this was going to work together. So I did up a flow chart of the entire installation that underwent a number of uh, revisions as we went along. And then I researched what gear would be needed and started buying stuff and getting familiar with it, breaking it all down into the smaller subsystems that could be independently tested. So I had this Prima Luce Eagle computer that goes right up on the telescope mount. And it's specifically for that, so it comes with a lot of things pre-installed, like the entire ASCOM system is installed on there when you get it. But of course, I still had to go install the drivers for all the ZWO and QHY cameras I have, the Lozmody mount, the Skywatcher mount, in case I decide to put that out there, filter wheel, focus motor, new ones from Next Dome for the dome rotation, the dome shutter, the rain sensor, weather manager, and safety monitor. And then, of course, you need your shooting apps on there, too. Sequence Generator Pro. I'm going to try Voyager and Nina. Uh, Fire Capture, Sharp Cap Pro, Auto Stackard, PH2 Guiding, Stellarium, and Nebulosity. And, of course, you've got to put on the entire ASTAP plate-solving images so that you can get uh, reference images that are easy to get in case your Internet connection goes down. This all took a couple of hours because of all the various resolutions I might be shooting at planetary up to wide field you just the number of ASTAP images that come in is incredible it take it took two hours to download them although remote desktop is built into windows i thought it'd be good to have team viewer on there as a backup there's another way you do it through the cell modem 
I had to understand how the shutter motor with its rain sensor and the dome rotator all received power and data. So I had to get them out and hook them up. For a month, my living room looked like a telescope workshop. Well, it still does. The shutter motor is interesting because it has its own internal battery that has to be charging when the observatory is closed. You can't really run a wire to it because it's on a spinning dome. So what they've arranged is a bracket that you mount on the observatory walls and when the dome is parked, these two metal discs are hanging down from the shutter motor to powered magnetic plates on the bracket, which is feeding power from a wall board. Well, users of the next dome report that this is pretty sketchy the way this is designed. Personally, I think whoever thought this up was on acid at the time, because it's just crazy. Uh, but in a remote situation, it's imperative that you get repeatable, reliable contact for the shutter's battery charging. If you end up with a dead battery while the shutter's open, well, then your entire rig is exposed to rain. The shutter motor has its own dedicated rain sensor. If it detects rain, it directly closes the dome shutter to protect your gear without having to rely on other software to establish a safe, unsafe condition and then follow instructions. To test it, I went to the kitchen, got my fingers wet, and sprinkled the sensor dome on the rain thing. And sure enough, the shutter motor fired up right away. So, okay, that works. All right, the dome motor gets both a power feed and a data feed, which is going to be from a long USB cable since it has to run all the way up onto the scope into the Prima Luce Eagle. The dome rotation motor communicates wirelessly with the shutter motor in order to send it commands. Getting the dome motor to consistently interface with the dome track is one of those sketchy things about a next dome, and it's going to be imperative to get that right for remote operation. And boy, when you see what we went through later, unbelievable. The Cloud Watcher from Lunatico, I think I'm pronouncing that right, has both rain and light sensors as well as humidity and sky sensors. And it doesn't have any kind of mounting bracket. It's kind of finicky. You have to go find one yourself. It needs to have a hole in it for a protrusion from the bottom. And uh, I found like a foot door opener at Lowe's that was about the right size and started drilling. Uh, it has to be mounted at an angle to allow for moisture to run off. I'm not super proud of the job I did on this, but it's going to work. It has a truly archaic 9-pin RS-232 data connection, like set your Wayback Machine for 1989, uh, that you'll need to use a USB to RS-232 converter for, or you can buy the companion box called the CloudWatcher Solo which is actually a little Raspberry Pi computer that acts as a web server and delivers you a nice graph of all the major readouts, which you can access from anywhere in the world. I ordered the Solo, although it was delayed in delivery because of the worldwide chip shortage. Power management is everything in an installation like this, and I admit I've had to make some educated but still very wild guesses about how much power I will need to get through the night of shooting and power the entire observatory with some kind of safety margin. And how long it will take to recharge my batteries in both the summer and the winter when you have short days and the sun angle on the solar panel is not optimum. Basically, you have a solar panel that produces electricity. You have batteries which receive those electrons and store them. You have some kind of remotely controlled power distribution box to send the power to the various systems in the observatory. Well, at the center of this, you have to have what's known as a charge controller, which takes the incoming electricity from the solar panel and sends it to the batteries in a controlled manner according to a charging profile for each of the main battery types, which in my case is lithium iron phosphate. I have two 100 watt hour batteries hooked up in parallel and the controller is supposed to keep them optimally charged by sensing how empty they are and charging them accordingly. Then the charge controller takes the output from the batteries and sends it to the DC distribution box, which controls the various subsystems in the observatory. As much as I try to keep everything in the 12-volt world, some of this stuff just has to run on wall warts from 110 volts AC, so I had to buy a voltage inverter and a power strip for this stuff. So it turns out the two cameras, the power supply for the alarm system, and the shutter charger uh, all had to be in there. When you employ one of these inverters, though, you have about a 50% power efficiency penalty. So really try and power only low current items this way. The solar panel 
was by LG. You know, it's funny. I, I did research on the solar panels and all of the names that come up at Lowe's and Home Depot are not the primary brands you want to get. So LG actually makes a brand new panel called the Neon. It's 364 watts and it and a stand was about $700. I had to spend about $35 to get some extension cables to bring the power into the observatory. Another thing I didn't know about solar power was that the angle of the panel makes a difference about how efficiently it makes the electricity. So I studied the solar panel angle recommendations and assembled the solar panel stand, measured the distance from the vertical foot to the extended foot, which will end up in the earth off of the pad by X many inches. I'm going to drill a hole in the top of two cinder blocks, put a screw for the solar panel foot coming up through it, and then bury the cinder block almost all the way, which is a lot easier than mixing concrete on site when you have no water. So I tested the batteries, the solar charge manager, and its Wi-Fi, the solar panel, and the DC power manager box in the parking lot of my storage unit. I got deeked by the charge controller. It looked like it was charging the batteries, but it wasn't. And... I didn't find that out until much later. So you have to be able to communicate with your remote observatory, right? There is no internet at the observatory, so the plan was to deploy a wireless hotspot cellular modem that would be contactable through the internet so I can remotely control the computer in the observatory from home. What could go wrong? Before I launch into the specifics, this was without a doubt the biggest complete mindfuck of the entire project. What I'm about to tell you is gospel. Learn the hard way, and if you deviate from this, you're probably going to be sorry. So I'm an AT&T customer with my cell service, and I actually have a decent LTE signal at the observatory site. At least it's enough to make a stable cell call, but nowhere close to four bars. So I decided to go with them. The cell router, there's a bunch of them on the market. I decided that I wanted something that looked pretty serviceable. It's going to be outdoors essentially all the time. So I looked at some brands and I found one that looked at least semi-professional, not the cheapest. It was from a company called Tactical. This ended up being a huge mistake, total offshore Chinese garbage. Their tech support was laughable and went from that to non-existent. Uh, to cut to the chase, there is really only one brand of cell modem you should consider, and that's from a company called Cradle Point. They are the people who put these devices in first responder vehicles so they're reliable and tough and have unbelievable knowledgeable onshore tech support people that you can call at 2 a.m. and talk to somebody. Amazing. I ended up buying the IBR200, which was only about $300, which was great because they make stuff that costs $10,000. I only had one Ethernet port out on there and I needed three. So I bought a Netgear four-port switch, which could be called an internet splitter, to distribute the internet around the observatory. I needed it for the computer, the mount, the cloud watcher, and also the power distribution box. The Cradle Point is backed up by an online service of theirs called NetCloud, and you get a subscription for X many years when you buy your unit. Once your unit is deployed, this is how you contact it, change the settings on it, or interact with the gear that's on the other side of it. In my case, that would be the telescope or the dome or all of that other stuff. I was able to test a certain amount of this here at home, but a full-scale mock-up test just wasn't feasible. So I tested small segments for general aliveness and experimented with the software setups and all. Somewhere along the way, I messed up the Prima Luce computer trying to get it to automatically reboot after a power loss, so I had to send it back. Tom at Prima Luce did a great job of getting it back, and I didn't even have to reinstall all the software. He made backups and an image of the internal drive as a safety, too. That was terrific. This continued for a few months until mid-October, when the dome finally showed up, delayed another month beyond the promised September date, causing me to postpone my install day twice, and it actually arrived only the day before the scheduled install day, the third one. It was held up in customs for two days and a weekend simply because I wanted it delivered to my storage unit address instead of my condo. What good would it have done there? Nevertheless, we got to it the following day, and the entire Next Dome installation saga will be laid out in video number five in this series, coming right up. Right up.